can we generalize from animal experiments to humans is, what, is a difficult question. So I'm going to concentrate on an easier question, which is, can we generalize from human experiments to humans? Because I've recently in encountered uh, people who don't believe we can. So if we can't do that special case, generalizing, generalizing from data collected on humans, to other humans, unless we know how to do that, then generalizing from data on animals to humans is uh, clearly more problematic. So I'll consider the easy case first. And so what I want to do is I, wa I want to just sort of tell you a story about a, a treatment, a clinical problem, um, and, so, and some results. And we can see the extent to which, see, you can see the problems that I've, I've come up against. So this is uh, a little girl called Otako Okamoto who was born in Japan in 1918. And I, I met her last Christmas and I made a film about her. I'm very excited about her. Uh, but she, I think she was about six there. She became a medical student. This is her doing her dissection. She got very interested in physiology and decided to be a physiologist. And she, here she's doing animal experiments. Um, it looks like the family dog, but um, I don't think it was. Uh, but anyway, she's doing animal experiments. And then actually she stopped doing animal experiments because she couldn't get hold of animals anymore. Um, and so she, she, what, she started working on blood because she realized she could take her own if she became short of it. And that's what she did. So she worked on, um, on blood, and there, she was very interested in this particular observation, that when you take blood from somebody, it initially clots, and then it unclots. And she was interested in that unclotting process. And uh, she uh, married another physiologist, and they worked together, and uh, they were very interested in this unclotting problem. So this slide shows uh, red blood cells, these nice pink things here, and this is a fibrin blood clot. And this is uh, my demonstration. So I, I'm trying to move away from PowerPoint. I'm trying to be the beyond PowerPoint generation. <laughs> so what I've got here is a model of human clotting. So what happens is, uh, I want you to imagine that this is a wound, right? So imagine this is someone's uh, cannonball to the stomach, right? So there's a big wound, and when you get wounded, what happens is it bleeds. So you've got lots of blood. Whoops, so Daisy. You've got lots of blood in the wound, like that. And the trouble with blood is that it falls out. And if it falls out here, it really will be trouble. But um, so the blood falls out of the wound. And if it all falls out, you die, right? But the, the body responds by making a clot, and it's that stuff that you see up there. And I brought some from London, and here it is. <laughs> so this is fibrin, fibrin blood clot, and it goes in there like that. And you can, and the, you can see that the fibrin, the fibrin blood clot, let me use my, and I'll use my scissors, the fibrin blood clot makes the blood uh, less likely to fall out. Yeah? But there's this evil enzyme called plasmin, right? So this enzyme is called plasmin. And what plasmin does, for some reason I, I really don't understand, is after you've been injured, it comes along and it starts cutting up the blood clot. And so the blood gets thin again. So plasmin starts cutting up the blood clot, the blood gets thin again. Now what Utako Okamoto was, she, this lady that I've shown you uh, back here, she, she wanted to find a drug that inhibited plasmin. And she found one, it's called tranexamic acid. There we are. <laughs> now it's impossible for plasmin, I can't do it. It doesn't work. So she found this inf a, a, an effective inhibitor of plasmin, 
tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, effort and uh, very, very nice discovery. And um, let's keep going. And here's the, evil en here's the evil enzyme. And she found this drug called tranexamic acid. It inhibits plasmin. And they got quite famous about it for a while. She won an award with her husband. This is the award. I saw it on the, on the, uh, the wall of her house, and I, and I took this photograph. And uh, it was tremendous. And there have been lots and lots of randomized controlled trials of the use of this drug in patients having surgery. Because when you have surgery, this business goes on. You know, the blood and the coming out and the clot and the chop, 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 plasmin. And so um, they thought it would be a good idea to give patients undergoing surgery tranexamic acid to see if they bleed less. And they do tremendously much. So this is a data from a systematic review of randomized controlled trials of plasmin administration for patients undergoing surgery. And you can see that um, there's, um, sorry, sorry tra tranexamic acid. Thank you, Ian. I get excited, you know, that's my, <laughs> that's my personal weakness. And then I can say things that, that, that one aren't true, uh, totally misleading, and it, in both my social and professional life. Anyway, so, <laughs> so tranexamic acid really reduces the need for blood transfusion in surgery. Tremendous result. Now, you, the interesting thing about this result is this result is super precise. You know, it's outrageously precise. So they've been, and, it's, and it's precise because there have been lots and lots of randomized controlled trials. Lots and lots. In fact, there was one at Christmas uh, in the BMJ. Uh, this was a tranexamic acid to reduce transfusion in patients undergoing surgery on the prostate, you know. And they've, they've done wherever, you know, they've done randomized controlled trials of surgeries all over the body, and that's the interesting thing. Uh, so this one, they found out that giving tranexamic acid when you do an operation on the prostate reduces the amount of blood loss. Now, this is a cumulative meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials of tranexamic acid in patients undergoing surgery. So these are all the, the trials here. There's been, I don't know, maybe 100. And this is a cumulative meta-analysis. So it's what it is. It's adding each new trial onto the one before, and you get a more and more and more precise estimate of the treatment effect. And look at this. Ooh. It's really super precise. And in fact, there was this, this study in the BMJ. You, you can't see because it's, I've included it. It's this one here, right? It's this one here. And if I expand it, you can see it's there. Now, the result before this important paper was published, the relative risk was 0.6 with a confidence interval from 0.56 to 0.64. After, the relative risk was 0.6 with a confidence interval from 0.56 to 0.64. Was it, is this a contribution to science? I don't really know. It certainly didn't, you've got, you've got this piece of information that changed nothing. And it's, uh, you know, it's, celebrated publication in the, in the British Medical Journal. And I think the problem, it, the problem is a problem of generalization. So it's, you know, the, 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 the hip surgeons do a randomized control trial of tranexamic acid, and then the knee surgeons do one, and then the ankle surgeons do it, and then the toe surgeons do one. And it gets a little bit silly because it's a failure to generalize. So how do we generalize? That, that, that's what I think is the interesting question, and it must have a bearing on animal experiments going to humans. Um, but what, what I wanted this model to show is that the effect of tranexamic acid on, in, on plasmin in the context of a fibrin clot doesn't depend on where, on the, where in the body the fibrin clot is. That's, so there are some things that are relevant to the generalization, and there are some things that are irrelevant to the generalization. And so where in the body the clot is, is probably irrelevant to the generalization. Um, 
And so we probably didn't need all of it. But that's, that's a judgment. It's not, it's something that you just have to, uh, it's a theory. So um, now the interesting thing is, let me just whiz back quickly. Oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. But basically, there's overwhelming evidence that tranexamic acid stops you bleeding in surgery. The question is, does it stop you bleeding in trauma? So this, this man's been shot in the stomach, and um, he's bleeding, and he might bleed to death. So we thought, well, would have people made that generalization from the fact that tranexamic acid stops you bleeding in surgery to it might stop you bleeding in trauma? They hadn't. So we looked for randomized controlled trials, and there were none. We did a systematic review of randomized controlled trials of tranexamic acid in trauma patients, not one. Uh, interesting. So we did one, and we got, um, with a big group of doctors from all around the world, we randomized 20,211 trauma patients, 10,000 got tranexamic acid, 10,000 got placebo, and we got a beautiful result. You know, uh, it, I, I use this excuse of generalization just to show it to you, really, because um, I've been doing randomized trials for 20 years, and it's, it's the only time I've ever found anything that's effective. Um, <laughs> well, you can laugh, but it's absolutely true. Uh, I've had a, a lousy uh, track record <laughs> in, in that sense. So beautiful result, highly statistically significant reduction in mortality, highly statistically significant reduction in the chances of bleeding to death, which is how you'd think it might work. And the question I, that this was, so two years ago, and now, to what extent is this getting out into clinical practice? And there I found this interesting problem of generalizability crops up again. And I've, I've, I think there are two types of humans. There's human homo representatus, it's a subspecies. The animal people understand this kind of thing. Homo representatus and homo mechanisticus. And actually, people sort of divide into these two types of people. And, and it's an important distinction when it comes to the, how they generalize uh, the results of scientific research. So this is a homo representatus. This is how they think. So what, this is uh, two doctors from... The, um, a hospital in Melbourne who wrote an editorial about this trial result, and they said, who then should be treated with tranexamic acid? Most of the, most of the study sites uh, were in low- and middle-income countries where other treatments such as fresh frozen plasma platelets are less available. Far less clear is the place of tranexamic acid in high-income countries. Um, and actually, they, they concluded that this result was tremendous news for poor people, um, but it didn't really have any relevance for rich people. Uh, now, the thing is, is it, is it relevant? This is, this is my wallet. Is it relevant to the generalization? I would say not, but maybe, you know, but I could be wrong. But so they think it is, and they're homo representatus. Fortunately, if you do a really big trial like this, you can actually test to see if homo representatus is right or not. And actually, what we've got here is a, we didn't want to do it by hospital, because that's cutting the data too thin, but we made a, a subgroup analysis, not pre-specified subgroup analysis, of the effect of tranexamic acid by continent. Um, and in a subgroup analysis like this, the comparator is not the null value, it's the overall treatment effect. So you compare the, the continent-specific effect estimates with the overall treatment effect. And in this case, uh, actually, homo representatus, well, th th these people from uh, Australia were wrong. You know, it's actually, it's every bit as effective in high-income countries as it is in, in, uh, in Africa, for example. But this way of thinking is very common. And um, I encountered it as well with the military. Now, I think if I click on, on this picture, this is a... a Maybe it doesn't work. Ah, no, I have to do something else. Hold on. Uh, short video. Oh, that doesn't.
It's a fact of war, many injuries suffered on the battlefield result in severe bleeding. Stopping it is key to saving lives. So the discovery that an old drug can perform new tricks is great news for military personnel. There was a recent trial carried out by the London School of Hygiene of Tropical Medicine, um, which was sponsored by NIHR called Crash 2 Trial. And it looked at the introduction of something called tranexamic acid, which stops clots breaking down. Within weeks of that trial delivering its results, we now use that as part of our treatment process. So that was really good. Um, so that, you know, it's very nice for, for uh, research into practice that the British military started using this treatment straight away in Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that. Then we had this interesting observation that the American military decided not to use it uh, because they, 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 there weren't any Americans in the study and um, so the extent to which Homo representatus thinks, the extent to which we can generalize to Americans is, you know, questionable. Uh, so, so what they decided to do, they did their own non-randomized study. Now, what we had is we had, there's this big camp in Afghanistan called Camp Bastion where injured soldiers of, uh, uh, from all over Afghanistan are flown into. And if they're treated by British doctors who who believe the results of the CRASH-2 trial, they get tranexamic acid. If they're treated by American doctors who don't, they don't. Um, so they said, well, let's do a comparison of these two groups of patients, and that's what they did. Now, fortunately, um, fortunately, well, it's, first of all, it's not very good research. You know, you should really do, if you want to know if a treatment works, you should do a randomized control trial. Observational studies of treatment effectiveness are notoriously misleading. Uh, even if you do this, if you try and adjust for all the factors that may affect the outcome apart from the treatment. I, I know this because there's a big study, there was, a, big, there was a, a trauma cohort in Manchester, and the main result was that if, with your trauma, you're treated by a senior clinician, you're much more likely to die. So what do we conclude? We go into hospital, give me a junior. You know, we're not going to do that. It's probably because the senior doctors see the sicker patients. So, fortunately in this case, the patients, the, 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 the soldiers that the English, uh, British doctors treated were much more severely injured than the American doctors. So you couldn't, you know, uh, on average, you couldn't use that explanation. And they saw this big difference. Now, I'm a little bit conflicted by these results because I think they, are, they go in the right direction, but I don't trust them at all. Uh, so I, I never know what to do with them. You know, they're politically useful, but scientifically uh, devious. Um, but so they saw these results, and now they conclude that the treatment actually works in Americans too. So that's interesting. And I had to, um, and it's a serious job to try and convince American military surgeons, uh, especially with abstract concepts like relative risk. So the treatment reduced the risk of bleeding to death by about 30%. So before the meeting, I went to, um, I went to Arlington Cemetery. Uh, and it just so happens that in this photograph, there are 100 graves. So I, how, do you, how do you express a concept like relative risk, you know, 30% relative? Uh, it, it's difficult. Uh, so what I did is, so 100 graves, if you treat with tranexamic acid, it'll look like that. So they understood that. Uh, <laughs> They, they, they had no difficulty getting their heads around that. But there are other questions. You know, to what extent can we generalize to other groups? So, um, for example, then we look to see, well, look, this treatment seems to work in bleeding surgical patients. It seems to work in bleeding trauma patients. Half a million women bleed, well, a couple of hundred thousand women bleed to death every year from postpartum hemorrhage. Does it work in them? So we looked for evidence to see if it did. We didn't find any reliable evidence, and now we're doing a big trial. But this question of how we, we generalize from one group to another, I think is very interesting. And it must have a bearing on how we use the results from animal experiments. So, Homo representatus, I think, is seriously misleading. And I think I would, my preference is Homo mechanisticus, 
where actually whether we can generalize from one group to another depends on a judgment, just a judgment about what's relevant to the generalization. So in this case, um, oh look, I can do this. So this is, um, this is uh, tomato ketchup, it's red, and this is uh, brown sauce. I don't know what it's called. Brown sauce, it says on there. So th the question w would be, you know, you know, if that was a different species, would it work with brown sauce, you know? So there, there it's different because, you know, the type of blood, it's, you know, it could easily be relevant to the generalization. So it's changed my... Um, thinking about these issues is, has made me uh, much more interested in animal experiments because I think... I thought that it was all about concordance. You know, does the res results from animal experiments, are they, do they concur with the results of human experiments? But I think animal experiments might have a value uh, apart from that. Perhaps that's the wrong way to think of animal experimentation. Maybe it's, we've, I mean, first we've got to do valid, reliable experiments, goes without saying, and we've got to syst do systematic reviews about them. But it... Animal experiments can teach us about the mechanism and that can help us to decide what is relevant to the, you know, to the mechanism to make that generalization. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>